The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss. And now that we have finished that massive opening Sonata Allegro in the form of a fantasy, this being the Symphonie Fantastique, we are going to turn to the second movement and let's talk about it a little bit. I cover some of this very, very briefly in the intro video, which I hope all of you have watched. But just to talk about the context of following a sonata allegro with a waltz. This is sort of a waltz movement. And we need to remember that at that time, in concert music anyway, um, the waltz was a new idea. And that's because with the aristocracy, it was a new kind of uh, dance form that was being elevated up from like folk dance into like more aristocratic circles and was sort of being tamed and um, kind of made into a more scholarly form. I don't know, that's maybe that's the wrong, that's the wrong term to use, uh, not scholarly, but more formal uh, in terms of a formal ballroom dance. And yeah, it was a huge craze. And if you look at the um, at the output of Schubert, which would have been about 10 years before this. He wrote endless uh, collections of waltzes that could be played on the piano for, you know, for your little parlor party or whatever. So it was really music that was intended to be used, not just to be played for fun. And in the context of a symphony, though, What's clever about this is that this takes the place of a scherzo. So once again, we see the influence of Beethoven on Berlioz, right? The idea of following the Allegro movement with a scherzo. We see that in Beethoven's Ninth, don't we? With the scherzo movement following the, following the Allegro. So in this case, the scherzo is also itself following the basic structure of the menuet, A, B, A, coda. And in this case, the A sections are two complete statements of the main waltz theme, followed by a little kind of wrap-up section that brings us back to the main waltz again. So that happens twice in each A section, and different orchestration in each of these A sections, uh, but generally the same structure in terms of melodic curves, development, etc. And then the B section in the middle, which we will study in the third of these lectures, is a restatement of the E day fix. However, you should not think that the E-Day fix is something that is just going to be trotted out for that one particular section because, to an extent, the main theme for this waltz, which we'll study at the, in the second part of this lecture, is somewhat based on the E-Day fix as well. So it's sort of a, a reinterpretation of it, uh, a, a transmogrification if you want to use a really fancy word. So you can hear some of the same kinds of ideas, similar arcs, and just, you know, some of the same melodic motion, but interpreted on different harmonic steps, right? So see if you recognize that when we check that out later on. But for now, Berlioz is going to start off with a very, very big introduction. And in that introduction, he's not just going to 
uh, set the stage in terms of our emotions and uh, and expectations but he's also going to introduce a new color to the orchestral palette but let's start at the very beginning and then I will talk about that really great introduction and its meaning and the specific technique that he used. So let's look at our orchestra to start off with. Flutes one and two, first oboe, right? So there is no second oboe for this movement. It just, it's not required. It's not any particular pet thing where he just wants to take the oboe out and play a solo with it and otherwise it's not needed. No, the oboe is very much a part of the texture. It's just that only one is needed. Two clarinets in A, so your transposition reading is going to be down a minor third, right? All right, now we've got our horns in E, right? On me, and in C. So first and second are in E, then third and fourth are in C, so the, the C transposition is going to be down an octave, sort of like bass oboe, right? So reading treble clef, sounding down an octave. However, <laughs> E transposition is one of those things where there is a very cool trick, which I'll explain a little bit later when we get to a horn part. But for now, just think that it is down not a major sixth, as in E flat, but a minor sixth. So it's less, just a little bit less far down, a half step less farther down to transpose when you see the pitches. All right, well, that is completely unnecessary for us to go into huge detail right now. And then, of course, just the strings and the harps, which I'll talk about in a minute. Just notice one thing about this. Um, he says here in French that he wants two harps on each part. All right, I'll also talk about the implications of that in a minute. We're starting off here with measured tremolo, and once again, just like in the Allegro, Berlioz is pushing this uh, measured tremolo so fast that it is nearly an unmeasured tremolo. And if you listen to a really good orchestra play this, then they really nail this. It really is yada da 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 da. So you just really can hear that those individual tremoloed notes, whether it's back and forth between two pitches or it is just the same pitch repeated. We've got a tempo mark here of dotted quarter note uh, 60, 60 beats per measure. And that's actually pretty fast if you think of each eighth note being right at around 180. All right, so, so that's really fast. Um, and it's just really nearly an unmeasured tremolo. And in fact, if you do play it unmeasured, it just kind of is not a huge difference. But there is a difference. So it, you know, it really does take a little bit of discipline to, to nail this if you really want to get that beautifully, perfectly unmeasured. You know, just really, just really want to get each of those four beats really, really clearly. And I feel that that is the way to do this: is to just really work on it to where it's very precise and it isn't unmeasured. Okay. <clears throat> now, notice the motion here. Um, he's starting off in A major, and he's <laughs> and he starts off outlining an A minor harmony. Uh, very, very fun. Uh, along with this, of course, A minor harmony right in here. And very, very simple, isn't it? The violas are playing an open A fifth right in here with the A minor, uh, like we've got an A minor third and a C third right here inside that same, uh, that same fifth. Okay, so we have this gesture, and then right here on the <laughs> on the fifth bar of the piece, Berlioz makes orchestration history by adding the harp, or actually, in this case, two harps doubling. And notice he says soli, right? So obviously it's intended to be two players on the same notes. Okay, so... <laughs> 
I talked about this once again in the introduction, but just to point out, as we will see over this section of the first half of this lecture, that for the most part, Berlioz is scoring in a way that could be played either by a double action harp or a single action harp. So with a double action harp, that's today's modern uh, today's modern harp, which can play any of the seven pitches, alphabetic pitches, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, in either flat, natural, or sharp position. Okay, well, back in the day, before the double action harp was invented in 1810, the single action harp existed and the only way to change pitch with that was to go up or down a half step right so um, so you could set the you could only you only had the range of a half step in terms of your pedal so your pedal could be set say at C natural right and then if you press the pedal down to tighten the tension on your string then you would get a C sharp so there are some flats marked in this piece, but they could easily be played enharmonically as sharps. Berlioz makes sure that he doesn't put the harp player into the position where they cannot negotiate it on a single action harp. He was very well aware of enharmonic pitches and so on. But seeing as how by 1830 the double action harp was still fairly rare and was only made by one company and at least with regard to the orchestra itself <laughs> was a resource that wasn't even being used right except for um, certain key pieces like for instance like a harp concerto right like the Mozart concerto for harp and flute so it it, it had entered the orchestral consciousness, but it wasn't really a standard member of the orchestral ensemble and really just had not been used in this way at all. So why does Berlioz uses it, use it? Well, it's you know, it doesn't really have anything to do so much with for its unique color as much as it is a part of what he's trying to describe here. Right? He is talking about a ball, right? So in that context, the harp would have been a very familiar element. So all of the posh people in the audience who had attended many a delightful soiree in their evening finest would be very familiar with this kind of color, right? The, just the, and notice how it's being used too. Berlioz must have studied what worked best for harp in those situations and then scored just what he heard. And he may have also been aware of the Mozart harp and flute concerto and studied some of the parts from that as well. So there are a few bars in that that are not the most ideal, but you know, they're as a concerto they work well. And so he scores pretty much in a way that, except for a few bars, doesn't take a huge amount of work for the player and yet is extremely effective. I mean, it would be better to score that way for harp in a way that really, you know, is idiomatic and fits with the instrument and so on and so forth to get the most effective, uh, best use of the harpist's time and, you know, most effective playing for the audience. So, so yeah, so the key points here, harp was a new resource as a regular ensemble member and Berlioz doubled up his harps. And just to relate one more point that I covered briefly in the intro, this is the biggest sticking point for this piece as a piece of repertoire in its day. Um, not so much some of the weird odd sock sort of instruments we consider today, like for instance the Ophiclide and the Serpent, which was in the original uh, manuscript for this piece and so on and so forth the bigger brass sections those were negotiable factors but 
adding the harp was a huge sticking point at first because it would, you're just finding four harpists, right? You could do this in Paris where there were plenty of harpists, but even then I'm sure that to find the find harpists who could play in an orchestra who had good instruments and everything else, it was probably still a little bit of a scary thing, a little bit uncertain. But go to places where the harp was less common, right? Then it would be much harder to put this on. Now, one last point I'm going to make about this is that for the most part, this balances really, really well if you follow Berlioz's instructions, which are to have the harps at the front of the orchestra and on either side of the conductor. So these would just be, you know, like a little bank of harps in front, which might block the audience's view of the orchestra and therefore be ignored and put in the back. Now, even today, this is put on by smaller orchestras and medium-sized orchestras, and they'll just use two harpists, and you really can't hear them that well unless they are being mic'd and put through the mains, which kinds of, which kind of, defeats the entire purpose. I I feel so. I think it's better to have the harps on either side of the orchestra, up front where they can be heard in a kind of a stereo effect and just to leave it at that and to really try to get four harp players even though that might be really difficult. This is a good option of a piece for countries where there are not a lot of harpists say here in New Zealand there are not a ton of harpists running around. We do have our share of really good pro harpists but it's not like they are growing on trees here. So this would be a case where a very good student would get a chance to play with an orchestra a lot sooner than say a student trombonist or a student violinist. So you know so long as the player really had it down and had their own instrument they could show up with their teacher and then maybe the co-principal harpist if there was one or the principal of the neighboring orchestra could bring her student or his student right so um, <laughs> that that would be a way for people to get a leg up studying harp. All right, so let's talk about the scoring. So I just talked about how it was very idiomatic. And and once again, we're seeing here, uh, this is all in F, right? So all natural, so it's just basically a big F chord uh, to follow the harmony of what's happening in the strings. Then we have this, uh, this chord go ahead, you know, we're adding an F sharp instead of an E right in here. And then that modulates to F sharp minor in the harps. And of course, that's just in the key signature. But notice how Berlioz is careful to write in the sharps, even though they're in the key signature, because we just had them natural in the previous harp. So there's absolutely no question that this is sharp and not natural. Okay, now here we're seeing some double action or single action uh, pedaling. So going to A sharp, right? And going to all sharps, really, right in here. Okay, and then G major, then G sharp, right? Turning it into a kind of diminished chord. Now here we see A flat and E flat. So this could just as easily be played as D sharp and G sharp without too much problem on a single action harp and harmonically. And the same thing right here. That could be played as A sharp and C sharp and may well have been, right? And as to the orchestra, basically the harp is, is just reacting right all the way through this so it's just adding its little bit of glitter and it's a really great use of harp to um, to decorate rather than to laboriously play the melody in fact the harp pretty much doesn't get the melody in this except for certain um, you know certain melodic gestures but it doesn't really play the main themes at all it just sort of provides this filigree over the top. Notice that Berlioz is scoring his harps in a way that you can really hear them, right? <clears throat> Reacting to 
the melodic motion in the lower strings, the, uh, the harps will play while the strings are pretty much at rest, right? So the melody stops and then you hear the glittering harp over the top. Now this isn't the way that it is always. Berlioz gets a little bit into his wishful thinking in a couple of very loud passages and at that point the harps just start to disappear and he must have been aware of that but just like every other orchestrator since he had that hope that they would be heard <laughs> and um, he was sort of wrong but I can't fault him because it's no it's not a mistake that any other orchestrator of greatness hasn't made right so you just you just hope for the best and you hope for the the harp to come through somehow and putting them at the front of the stage and doubling them uh, in weight would be one way to do that. Now, let me just comment about this. I feel that if your harpists are absolutely perfectly in tune, that doubling is okay and it does sort of increase the intensity of the note while not necessarily increasing its loudness, right? So it's it's not a it's just a question of being able to project a little bit further right but it's it's not really a, a sense of loudness in the way that we consider like turning a dial up and down and Wagner went even further he had triple harps um, he had a bank of six harps and each of them would be tripling on a particular note or chord to make things really big and lush and sometimes the six players would each play an individual um, uh, an individual part, but that was kind of to just portray this sort of glittering um, and, and not necessarily anything intricate or contrapuntal. Okay, so it's, it's something that Berlioz, as the first orchestrator of significance to use a harp, was aware of. I mean, if we don't count the concertos. Um, the concerto written by Mozart and so on. So first orchestrator of significance was immediately aware of the balance problems and doubled up his harps and it, the risk is that if the harps are not absolutely completely in tune that you really will hear uh, that kind of strange detuning sound um, sort of like a slightly out of tune six string guitar or or mandolin right that's and that's something you really want to avoid. So you have to have really good in-tune players for this. And that probably was one of the biggest problems with stagings of this work, with performances of this work back in the day, would have been harps that went out of tune because of theaters not having air conditioning and, and so on. And, and so long as the harpist really had a chance to tune just before this movement, then it was probably okay. And, and of course, in a recording situation, that's what you would want. Now, one last little comment about these lovely big arcs being played by our lower strings is that the double basses are playing single notes, very smooth single notes, and the cellos are like vibrating above them. And I feel that that's a very effective kind of octave doubling. Okay, so as the little gestures from the lower strings get shorter, so do the replies from the harps above. And things are very, very slowly increasing in terms of volume. And the violins start to start to play along with the uh, repeated notes and we have this wonderful warmth emerging from the flutes and oboe and just so lovely it's just like the dawn breaking really from the from the uh, darkness now here we get into some harp scoring that's very difficult to hear uh, if the orchestra isn't balanced right and the harps aren't in front and everything else. So this it really is, and even with nicely balanced recordings, it's very difficult to hear. So, so here's a place where you see the wishful thinking right from the very beginning. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it's, it's something like if you're sitting next to the harpist, you'll be able to hear this fine. 
Now, this is really, really lovely right in here. Um, so you, we've got in octaves, notice that the right hand here is ottava over the left hand. We've got descending thirds in octaves, and it has a beautiful glittering sound if you have four harpists playing this. And he's just really showcasing them here. So if you consider this to be melodic motion, the harp gets the melody. Uh, if you just consider it to be a descending scale, all right, uh, then it is not melodic motion necessarily. I mean, it's it's obviously it's um, obviously it it is a scale, and it's uh, you know it's moving in melodic seconds. But is it a melody? Right, that's a different kind of question. And what's really great is as the harp descends down, all the way to this low A here in the second harps. We hear uh, flute and oboe adding, then the clarinets, and then the second flute coming in and doubling the oboe. And it just has this beautiful, lovely, um, just bright sound um, answering the harps. While, of course, the horns and the, and the strings kind of punch out the harmonic motion the going towards the cadence. Okay, so <clears throat> I told you that I would teach you a trick about reading horn in E. All right, okay, here is the trick. So, and this only works if you're you're very well versed in reading bass clef, right? So if you are coming to this from, say, like just a woodwind perspective and all you've ever played is treble clefs, then this might not be that helpful. If you're still learning bass clef. Okay. <laughs> and that is that you can read these parts by imagining a bass clef, right, in the key of E, and then ottava, right? So so we're just going to we're going to draw this imaginary bass clef in in our mind, you know, a little dot here and then a curve and a couple of dots there and then the E major key signature. So what does this turn into? This turns into an E fourth, right? So E and A uh, up an octave, right? And then of course these are octave E's sounding down an octave, right? So so you would have um, e below middle C, E above middle C, right? And that note, E above middle C, is the same note as this, right? So thinking, so if we if we discard our little um, our little trick and just think down a minor sixth, right? We end up with an E, right? So that's doubling on this note, and then above that an A. Uh, down a minor sixth from F is A. So whichever way you decide to transpose, you know, if you want to use the little bass clef trick, like if you use that here, you see that this is B and G sharp, right? Um, and if you just think down a, um, if you if you just think down a um, a perfect, excuse me, if you think down a minor six, then this is the G sharp uh, in the treble staff, and then. <clears throat> this right here is down a minor six from G to B and so on. So anyways, whichever trick works, um, that is the way to uh, to instantly at sight to very quickly transpose the um, the pitches. Of course, you have to remember that they're an octave higher. Okay. So you know basically we are you know we're we're doing ones and fives here mostly, with the exception right here of um, D major. Okay, so let's have a listen to all of that, okay? Uh, listen to just how, for the most part, uh, Berlioz leaves open space for his harps to sound really beautiful, and occasionally he adds to them, like for instance here, with the winds on top, but that doesn't cloud the uh, the clarity of what the harps are doing here. However, you will hear some problems right in here of the harps really projecting uh, against this 
big tutti. And it's probably one of these things where maybe Berlioz, I, I haven't heard, I haven't like read the original score, but I imagine that Berlioz was anticipating some of that, but probably became even more aware of that uh, as he was, you know, he heard the first performance, he did some revisions and so on, uh, and and he may have made some changes. So I, I have not looked into that, but it might be a possibility. Okay. And then just the lovely warmth of the scoring here in the winds emerging and brightening the color, right? And of course, just this lovely, um, this lovely 6-4 chord. I just, yeah, it's just, you know, very classical <laughs> in a way. But, uh, but of course, the intentions uh, having that very romantic um, uh, tone painting. There is a little bit of double stop scoring right in here. We can see this, and this is actually very simple. You know, we, we, here we've got these notes really far apart and really far apart here, but that's quite simple if you just remember that the, uh, the lower pitch is an open A, right? So if you've got that open A, you can play anything on top of it. And then, of course, playing an E octave, that's no big deal um, for first violins. And then the sixths, it's all very simple. You know, here you've got these octaves here, these E octaves in the violas, it's also very, very simple to play. And then, of course, sixths and so on. So, yeah, all very easy to handle. Uh, here we got these chords right in here, and these could be played divisi, or you could just play an A third um, on your second and third strings right under the open E. Right? There, there are some ways of doing this. You could play open A and open E, and then a high C sharp on the um, on the third string. But I, I wouldn't play it that way. I'd just play the A third myself under the open E. So it and then right in here this is an open A and kind of same deal below here you've got a C sharp third in your violas and that's that's easy enough to play. But of course you have to recall that these are going to be very quick strokes of these triple stops right in here. That they're going to just rip across the strings. Um, and if it's done sort of loudly and quickly enough, it gives the impression that all the strings are really playing at once. But that's not the reality, and of course you couldn't hold these pitches for very long without lo letting go of the bottom note. All right, so, <clears throat> so listen for all of those things. <clears throat> listen for just how amazingly quickly the, um, the tremolo is going. And then of course, the conversation between uh, the lower strings playing their gestures and the harps reacting. It's interesting, isn't it, that the that by the time you get to here, the second harps are playing on the third eighth note of the bar. Then just before that, the first harps played on the second eighth of the bar, and then here they were on the first eighth of the bar. So they just kind of they're slowly. Um, retreating from the downbeat or moving back from the downbeat. And yeah, just in general, the reaction of the harps, that wonderful color coming into the texture. Especially in the context of having just heard this very, very intense Sonata Allegro opening um, that was groundbreaking enough in itself, um, but you know, more in terms of structure and emotionalism, um, or as much as in structure and emotionalism as in advances in orchestration, all of which really came together, right? So then just starting from this new place of uncertainty, we hear this beautiful gleaming voice coming out of the orchestra, and it must have been incredibly enchanting. I'm Before we jump into this and have a listen to this, I want you to consider one thing about this, and that is that I'm sure that this idea of putting in a waltz here was just a, a natural outcome of how this piece evolved in Berlioz's imagination. However, I feel that it was 
a stroke of genius and a stroke of luck <laughs> because this movement was probably very, very much appreciated by, shall we say, less sophisticated members of the audience, by concert goers who were interested in, in very listenable music. They would have found this very listenable and very enchanting, and especially after that somewhat torturous first movement um, that would have sort of blasted open their expectations and listening and everything else, and then to hear this wonderful light music, um, I think that that would have made a huge... <clears throat> I think that would have made a huge impression on the average concert goer and probably contributed to this work gaining in popularity much, much quicker than it might have without it. So now we get to the nitty-gritty. <laughs> that entire thing we just talked about for half an hour uh, was actually just the intro, right? So now we are getting to the beginning of the A section. And the beginning of the A section has itself three bars of intro. Notice that I don't have the downbeat here because that was in the previous screen. So I'm just taking from the chuck-chuck, boom-chuck-chuck, chuck, and so on. And it's a very, very simple structure here and that simplicity also probably was very enchanting I would say to the average listener in the audience. We have to remember that the concert music audience was not filled with a bunch of musical snobs, right? Or uh, elitists or necessarily people who were uh, all that informed about music. The audience of the time would have had a lot of, you know, just ordinary folks coming along to the concert, just like today, right? It, 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 in pretty similar, and in fact, probably even more of what we would consider to be casual listeners. And this definitely would have been meat and potatoes kind of music for them, stuff that they were really used to hearing in more casual situations. And of course, the uh, amongst those who were more aristocratic in the audience, uh, but also might be what we would think of as average listeners. This would be, of course, resonant with them of having gone to fancy dress balls and so on and, and, um, and having a wonderful time dancing. And, of course, this is a really lovely waltz theme. Um, and, and yet it's very intelligently done. And, of course, behind that, there is lurking the E-Day fix. As I mentioned before, this theme is really just is based on it. If you take it apart, you see the relationship between this and the and that theme. And of course, that'll be underlined even more when we see the E-Day fix played as a waltz in the trio. But it's so adapted and so modified in this interpretation that it doesn't matter that it's basically the same thing again, right? <clears throat> so here we have the first part of the melody and as I mentioned before ABA construction we're going to run through the whole melody twice. So this is the the main melodic idea. Now very simple the first violins are playing it and right in here Berlioz throws in a little bit of, in this case, I would call it portamento, <clears throat> rather than just glissando. <clears throat> and the reason why I would call it portamento is because he is moving the position of the fingers down, right? So this would, this would be played on the A string, so that the player could shift between F sharp and and D, right? They could move down. And the um, 
the portamento is really just happening at the end, you know. Da, da, da. Right, so it's it's not going da, it's going da, 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 da. Right, so it's just really moving um, moving down at the sort of at the end of the duration rather than throughout the duration. But and notice that the also that the the idea of portamento or glissando was so um, <clears throat> so it's such a new thing that he had to write in. Right, Hector Berlioz wrote this note, HB. He had to write in for the players that this was something that was wanted, and probably in, you know, this would be a more uh, trashy <laughs> kind of over emotional way of connecting two notes back in the day. But Berlioz shows that look, it could be very sophisticated and beautiful, right? So, uh, so I consider it portamento because it moves the position of the fingers and then the fingers continue on, right? Rather than glissando, which is really the effect for its own sake. So yeah, so um, without getting into positions too much, it's it just makes things a lot easier to move the hands, the fingers down, and then you can just play the rest of, of this over the second and third strings. Okay. <clears throat> Now, having heard this played by different violinists, I can say that it is actually not the easiest thing. Um, you know, da, da, da. Uh, especially like where does the emphasis go? You know, da, da, da. Is it da, da, da? Or is it da, 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 da? And then if that is the case, do you put a little bit of emphasis right here in the middle? And thinking about all of those different things, you know, can you play that smoothly and everything else? So it it's um, it does take a little bit of work. Another thing to think about here is how is Berlioz asking the players to bow this, right? So down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, right? And then replace the bow, down, up, down, up, down, and then here, I think that really, you know, da, da, da. I've actually seen players just play play this in one under one bow right here, right? Just like uh, cover this and just just the bow just moves over to the higher string here to get this, rather than putting too much emphasis right here in the middle. Okay, um, and here, like we've got. A down bow, and then here this might be played with two up bows. Yet, yeah, yet, yeah. and then duh, right, and then and so on. Of course, but this um, there was a tip that I just shared in um, on the website from One Hundred More Orchestration Tips. And of course, if you are a Patreon supporter and you have got your complimentary copy of One Hundred More Orchestration Tips, you can go look it up just there. But it's on the website. And it's talking about um, slurring or re-articulating re notes um, at the end of a glissando. So in this case, it's obvious. Uh, Berlioz slurs across, so he wants all of these notes under one bow. But sometimes there's a slur without, <laughs> or excuse me, there is a portamento or glissando without a slur. And it may be the intention of the composer that you go down bow and then up bow at the end of the glissando. And sometimes that can be quite, uh, it, can, it can be really wonderful and effective to give it some attack, right? Because like it just really fixes the, the focus of the listener right on that motion and pays it off. So have a look at that tip. I explain more in detail. I don't want to go over too much now, but yeah. And also notice like that this is really considered to be very emotional and and almost sentimental, right? We, uh, dolce and so uh, dolce a tenero, so in other words, um, sweet or soft and tender. And then here, Rollentondo um, 
and, and and you know it's coming towards like the end of this phrase and that you know i mean a little schmaltzy you would think da, 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 da. but the fact is that it's very very true to the way that dances were danced right so uh, that was probably already in the waltz to have the music sort of slow down at a certain motion of like perhaps turning your partner around or sort of leaning back or some other things that might have been expected when you were at uh, beat, let's see, 4, 8, uh, 11, 12, right? Uh, so anyhow, <laughs> going on. Um, so so that's pretty much the, the main theme of this scherzo waltz. Then on the next page, we sort of see kind of like the second half. And then here you're seeing that some of that um, influence of the E-Day fix coming through. You know, da, 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 da. You know, so there's that same kind of thing in the E-Day fix, isn't there? Da, 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 da. So that's that same kind of, kind of slightly limping quality to the melody. But notice, <clears throat> with the entrance of the first harps, <laughs> of harps 1A and 1B, once again, the, the scoring is very idiomatic, but the point is that the music going that's playing along with the harp here is really quite uh, backing off, right? So pizzicato, basses and cellos, so that does not interfere with the harps at all, just really softens the bass. And... Um, Playing this at a softer, you know, there's just these little, um, these little repeated harmonies right in here. When the strings come in here, they do not blur out the accompaniment, this sort of glittering accompaniment of the harp, and it really contributes to that kind of hallucinatory uh, feeling of just feeling like that you were in a ballroom. Notice the uh, the dynamics being boosted to mezzo forte. All right, what were they in the previous screen? Piano, right? And even though it's a sforzando here, it's obviously intended just to go back to a piano, an expressive piano. So right away, Berlioz realized from the beginning of orchestrating for harp that harps might need to be boosted, might need to play out, right? And you know, even though it's saying soli and like you would think, oh, well, solos are often marked louder. Well, sometimes you don't need to, to do that on a featured line or a solo. It can be the it can be marked the same dynamic level as everything else, just like the violins are here. This is more of a balance thing, right? So he knew that he would run into this <laughs> from the very beginning as a conductor. So he just wrote it right into the part. So the players realize that they are intended to play out here. And I have to say, you know, with the impact of this chord right here and the uh, and the first violins and so on, the harps do disappear a little bit right here. But that's just a compromise. You just have to deal with it, right? Um, if you're focused so much on the harp just to absolutely make sure that it is playing as loudly as possible in every single moment, as a listener, you really stop, you stop enjoying everything about the rest of the music. So that's just a compromise we all have to deal with. <coughs> But that doesn't necessarily mean you should just cut out the harp, right? Because you're wasting the player's time, not at all. Notice how um, there's something really nice going on here. Um, right here we have this sort of lovely kind of uh, broken arpeggio, um, you know, just going down to the next step in the chord and then up, you know, leaping up across. So up a sixth, down a fourth, up a sixth, down a third, up a fifth, down a third, and so on. Just, just kind of kind of working our way through and then it reverses on the other way down kind of kind of like a Hannon exercise now here it goes to thirds and then the thirds take over split between the right hand of all four harpists so these are all at thirds and fourths We're just kind of going through the uh, the harmonic broken chords but harmonized this time what's very cool here is how the umpa is taken care of by the left hand of the second harp, 
or second harpist and the left hand of the first harpist kind of going back and forth between these two and that is just a really lovely effect if you can hear the harpists and the orchestra doesn't kind of go to town too much. Before I move to the next screen let's take a look at the composition of this chord. Very very simple, right? So it's basically an A major octave chord between the flutes and clarinets, remembering that this sounds down A minor third, right? So it's A and C sharp. And then, do you remember what I said about the bass clef plus ottava? So put a bass clef here, put an E major key signature here, right? And what is that? It's a C sharp third sounding up an octave, right? So think, um, let's look at this C major thing. So C sharp, E, and then the clarinets, a, C sharp, and then E, A, right? So it just really fills in the harmony there. Once again, Berlioz anticipating things that would be said by Rimsky-Korsakov uh, about 80 years later, or 77 years later. Now we've got everything coming to an end here with our strings and harps and solo flute, solo first flute and soli clarinets just running up here to that same chord, right, of A major, but voiced of course differently, C sharp thirds on top and then of course this is E and A below, sounding E and A below. And do you remember your transposition again? It's the same notes as before, a C sharp third. Uh, sounding, although written as an A third. And this will come through really beautifully, this big rolled chord uh, played by four harpists <laughs> will come through beautifully, even though we've got sforzando, winds, and strings. And that's just because of the more random nature of the downbeat, uh, when you have a strum or a roll. Once again, we're seeing influence from the E day fix, you know, the sort of kind of limping da, 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 right? That kind of idea. And it's just being developed here. And just, it's intended to be soft. And this is just a way of writing accent, really. Just da, 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 and this is just really lovely here. Just like this little pad is kind of these bum, 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 right here. And the winds coming in here and just warming it up in the middle. Just so lovely, such scoring. And then right in here, sounding B, right? An octave higher if you're thinking of bass clef. So sounding B below middle C. And what's really lovely here, soli marked pianissimo, right? But the the harps come through here beautifully. They're very, very easy to hear. So that sort of makes one full statement. And let's stop there for this lecture and we'll talk about the return of the of our A melody, which happens again, and then is wrapped up in a different way, uh, leading to the trio. And then, of course, for the return of the A section after the trio, it really is kind of the same uh, the same melodic development is just stated the same way, and then the wrap-up of the second part of, of A the second time leads to the coda. But we'll talk about that when we get there. I don't want to get too hung up in structure and so on and so forth, but just listen to how beautifully Berlioz makes room for his new partners, the harpists. And, you know, just just very just very beautifully scored strings. Um, very simply done. I, I love the uh, reversal of direction that we've got here in the harmony rather than everything kind of dipping down. We've got the lower strings coming from below and the upper strings coming from above. And just very, very nicely done. And, you know, keeping the low strings and octaves, the upper strings, uh, a fairly close harmony. That's all just really nice textbook, and yet just so, you know, just done so well. Just it's just.
feels right, right? And then this lone B just standing out. <laughs> um, hopefully not standing out too far. The It should be a part of this, but you'll still feel that warm sound coming from the middle. So yeah, listen for that. Listen for how easy it is to hear the harps kind of glittering in this big roll here, even though there's a nice big 2T chord here. And then just the cleverness of the scoring, the gestures here, the flutes rising up here to the big chord at D. The gentle uh, arpeggiation here, first with the first harps and then second harps coming in to harmonize. And uh, just you know, lovely little touches of warmth from the winds right in here, uh, accentuating this, the return of this high A. I right, just kind of restating that. And the effectiveness of the pizzicato, just really pacing things along under the harps and strings. And then just this sort of dollop of wallop here. This, <laughs> this very um, uh, very kind of common folk sort of scoring here this you know the boom chuck and the and the gentle you know beautiful melody over the top uh, the simplicity of it I feel would have been extremely attractive to the listeners not simplicity for simplicity's sake but the fact that in the middle of this massive emotional work that was really intended to be a great work of intellect and emotion that the artist has some of the common language in his sincere expressions. I think that that is something that people would have really valued and would have helped move them up to the more complex ideas. So listen for all of those things and I will see you very soon for the second part of Movement 2.